so, uh, so no pressure at all, obviously. Um, first of all, I just want to say how, thank you. I just want to say how, I want to say how happy I am to, uh, to be invited here to the Cauldron, um, which is just looking over the Offord Road, which as everyone probably knows here, the 19th century was famous for the quality of its prostitution. So I'm feeling very <laughs> happy to be here. Um, um, I'd just like to, um, to start with uh, what happened to be the night that our, f I don't know if, if many of you saw the film or not, but um, it came out um, and there's this thing called Twitter. And, um, uh, and on Twitter, someone called me up the night of the, uh, that the film went out on BBC Two and said, um, it's, it's, it's trending on, t on Twitter, which is like a good thing. And um, uh, so I went and I looked and saw what everyone was saying about it. And it was all very interesting. There was so many people talking about it. Um, but there was one person in particular who, uh, who really caught my attention with, um, with his comment, with his tweet. Um, so I'd just like to start by telling you about this tweet, um, maybe reading it to you. So it's, it starts like this. Why the fuck, <laughs> by the way, that's, this is totally verbatim, okay? Why the fuck is a yank telling the story of Cali Road? <laughs> At yank go home. So <laughs> this is totally true. <laughs> so it's not very generous, obviously, you know, kind of like a comment on my oeuvre. But, um, but actually, I thought that uh, he had a point, not exactly the point that he thought he was making, but an interesting point um, nonetheless, which is that um, I asked myself that same question during the making of the film. Not about my ability to, to tell the story because I'm a, I'm a fucking yank, but, um, but because uh, it did, I did ask myself the question of what gave anybody the ability to tell the story of the Cali Road? Now, when you begin a doc documentary, it's like you're, being a, you're, you're like a tourist in a foreign country. You have all these impressions at first, all these comparisons that you make with the places that you've, you've known in the past. Um, and the fact is that you see everything, but you're totally blind to what's really going on in front of you because you don't, you don't know enough. You don't know the people. You don't know what the meaning of the places are and the way people act. So you... You, you're, 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 you have this blindness, um, and when I would go back, but you don't want to admit it to yourself, so when I would go back to the production office um, to talk about uh, my experiences and to tell everyone how it had been going, um, and I, they would say, well, how's, how's it going on the Caledonian Road? And I would say, uh, first of all, it's the Cali, number one, right? It's the Cali. Um, and I was very proud of that. I said, well, the Cali this, the Cali that. The Cali's grimy, but the Cali's interesting. Um, the Cali is such a fascinating place. I was like uh, someone who just knew one uh, phrase in a, in, a, in, a, in a phrase book and just wanted to repeat it over and over again. Now, every place gives the impression of total solidity and um, inevit inevitability. It's the reality of every place we see is just as, it's as solid as the, as the bricks and mortar that, that make it up. But I always feel, I always sense, especially making this film, that there are just so many ghosts everywhere, especially in a place like the Cali. Not only the people that pass through the place um, or the way that it looked at any given moment in the past, but also about what didn't happen, the way it didn't turn out, what, what, the way it didn't become. Um, and the more time I spent on the Cali, the more I, I felt these ghosts. Um, and along with the people that I knew, these wonderful, wonderful people that I, that I met along the way, um, people like Norma, who uh, I have such respect for, and people like Randall, I don't know where Randall is, but uh, Randall Keynes, um, who's also such, a, such, a, you know, such interesting people. Um, and also the other people who aren't here, Eileen, who uh, ran this you know, brilliant pub that's been shut down inadvertently because of our film, um, which is very sad. Um, and uh, Roy, who was very famous, I don't know if you remember Roy, anyone who saw this film, but he's actually the person people remember because he told everybody about what the old men used to do at the, at the cattle market in the Cali. Um, and I won't get into it, but if you know, if you saw it, you know exactly what I'm referring to. Um, but then, as I thought about all these people I knew now, I thought about all these people in the past. Um, and I thought about George Thornhill. George Thornhill, you know, this name you see all over this area. And this man who bought these beautiful meadows here because of the snipe shooting. 
Um, he loved the snipe shooting. And um, I'm sorry, what? Uh, uh, um, and sorry. Uh, and, uh, and this man who actually um, decided when the London was going to, was just growing too big for, for its limits, decided to, uh, to build on it. And he built the Caledonian Road. And, you know, it, it's... It's, again, like I was saying before, it's something which seems quite random when you look at it. No, or, or maybe just it had to be that way. But it was that way because that was the edge of his property. And it was that, you know, it has that shape because it had to go around other properties that he didn't own. And that is the road that we know now. Um, and I think of him and I think of the people, the residents of the Caledonian Asylum. I hope, uh, I hope that they had uh, a nice time living in the asylum. I'm, I'm not, I'm not 100% positive, but um, um, I, I do think about them, and, and I also think about people like, well, the milkmaids now, obviously, and uh, even beyond that, maybe to the to the Roman wanderers who walked the fields and had no idea about what this place would become. And I began to feel this incredible responsibility, not only for the living, to tell the story of the living, but to tell the story of the dead. Um, and I don't know whether that's because of it, I'm a yank or just because of the, the, the way I am as a, as a documentary maker. But it's strange because if you saw me walk in, Tom, my AP who's there, was so responsible for, for, for the quality of the film, uh, who met so many people. Um, if you saw me walking down the street then and making this film, in the process of making this film, this guy from the BBC making this particular story, um, you'd see a guy who was just trying to make a film, trying to put, I, I had about 50 something minutes that I, I had to tell a certain number of stories in this time. Um, and even though the film, when you watch it, because of our craft, because of the way we do it, um, makes it seem so inevitable. It had to be this story. This was the history, the history of the Caledonian Road. Um, well, actually, it's much more haphazard than that, as I'm sure you all suspect. Um, it's a function of, of time. It's a function of money. It's a function of higher-ups telling you what you can and cannot do. Um, it's everything but this just, like, perfect, you know, inevitable history. Um, there's mainly a lot, a lot of times it's luck and, 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 and happenstance. For instance, the film that I thought I was gonna make was about crime on the Cali. That was like my first, I mean, that just tells you how I, you know, the tourists coming to the place, that was my first impression that I'm gonna like tell the story of crime, you know. And I met some interesting people including Peter Scott, does anyone remember Peter Scott here? Yeah, Peter Scott, the gentleman thief. Um, not so much of a gentleman, I wouldn't say, but he, and in fact, the reason he wasn't in the film, one reason was that he wanted lots and lots of money. <laughs> ten, I think 10, 20,000 pounds, which uh, he has no idea about BBC budgets, obviously. Um, and, um, and then there was this other story of, uh, we were gonna tell the story of Keystone Crescent, which is very interesting, because it's basically, there's a family of landlords that have been there since, since the 19th century. Um, and uh, the lo lovely people, but we found out this amazing thing that the that the father that the that the, the grandfather of the, of the current uh, people who uh, who are there uh, was a fascist, was a Mosleyite. Um, but interestingly, then in the 60s became someone who basically would only uh, rent uh, uh, rent uh, um, properties to people of color, and seemed to have kind of had a completely this amazing change in his in his politics. Unfortunately, we weren't able to include the story in, in our film because I think, I think his family, um, uh, his grandchildren, I think they were a bit suspicious of what my intentions were. Um, so, but I only bring that up to say it could have been that. If they had wanted to do it, uh, that would have been a major part of the story and maybe we wouldn't have told another bit of the story. But while I'm talking about this film that we were trying, that we ended up making, Inside, while I was making that, there was this other person inside me that was completely dissatisfied. I mean, the, the Cali cast this strange spell on me. I think anyone who knows it kind of understands what I'm talking about. It's an underdog. It's an underdog. It has this kind of sadness of forgotten lives. It's uh, wrong turns. And, but also, more importantly, the bravery of people trying to kind of live their lives, um, despite all the kind of greater forces in a you know, great city like London. And um, as I was trying to make the film um, that I could make in the real world that was possible, which in tried to include these feelings that I'm just talking about now, there was this other film I wanted to make, and I didn't even tell anyone because they would have thought I was completely mad. 
Um, because this film, I didn't want to just tell one story or two stories. I wanted to tell, I dreamt of a documentary that was as long, that lasted as long as the Rhodes history, so 300 years. That would include everyone living, everyone dead. That would include every moment of the Caledonian Road, a, totally, a, a totalizing vision of the Caledonian Road. And strangely, this is not so far away from uh, Charles Booth's impulse, Victorian impulse, which was at the heart of the series that we made. Because he had that Victorian idea of taking understanding um, knowledge to, to a new level, to quantify the city in a way that had never been done before, to define every street in the greatest city in the world, which is this amazing, amazing project. Um, and so what he did is he started walking he found authorities, he found vicars, he found policemen, and he would walk around and he would look, he'd speak to some poor people also, but mainly he would just look and he would judge. Um, and from these investigations, he made these maps. You're all familiar with these maps, I'm sure. Um, these incredible maps that, saw, that were really amazing things that defined each street in this city um, by its socioeconomic status from black, which, not so, I don't think so, so coincidentally, was vicious and semi-criminal, um, all the way to yellow, which was well-to-do. Um, and um, what he was really trying to do was fix the streets in time in a way to express their reality. Um, and thinking about Booth, I remembered um, this story I had read a long time ago by the Argentinian writer Jorge Luis Borges, um, which I'll read to you, it's very short. Um, and it purports to be this fragment of this 17th century travel story. And I think it's quite interesting, especially when you start thinking about, um, about Charles Booth. It's called An Exactitude in Science. In that empire, the art of cartography attained such perfection that the map of a single province occupied the entirety of a city and the map of the empire, the entirety of a province. In time, those unconscionable maps no longer satisfied, and the cartographer's guilds struck a map of the empire whose size was that of the empire and which coincided point for point with it. The following generations, who were not so fond of the study of cartography as their forebears had been, saw that this vast map was useless, and not with some pitilessness was it that they delivered it up to the inclemencies of sun and winters. In the deserts of the West still today, there are tattered ruins of that map, inhabited by animals and beggars. In all the land, there is no other relic of the disciplines of geography. Now, I'm not saying that Booth's map was useless. Far from it. I think it's an amazing achievement. But the meaning of this Borges story, and there are many meanings of it, but the one that I like to talk to you about today is how this map tries to replace the people who live there. And it seems to me always that life spills beyond any attempt to portray it. And that includes what I did with this film. And so when my Twitter friend asked, why the fuck is this Yank telling the story of Cali Road? My answer is, sorry, I tried to do my best. <laughs> and the only way I knew how in this film. But all I can think about, and this is true, is how I failed. Um, everything I couldn't include. Some things I brought to life, some facts I brought to life, some memories, but there were so many other things and so many other people that I wasn't able to include um, that are forgotten in a way. And just because we can't see it or define it or remember it doesn't mean that it's not there. Those lives, those moments are all part of the Cali Road story too. And I didn't tell the real story of the road. And you know, it never will be told because no one can tell any of it in its vast specificity, not a Yank or anybody else. Thank you. Thank you.